Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome. Um, yeah, let's just, uh, since it's a Friday morning after the replay party, we'll start off with a fun question to make sure everyone's awake. So we just went through uh, Black Friday a week ago and Cyber Monday. So how many people here bought something from Amazon in the last week? Well, yeah, that's actually most of the room. Um, how about in the last year? Is that like everyone? Yeah, that's everyone, okay. <laughs> and one more question. So how many of you would be a little bit upset or a little frustrated if what you bought didn't get delivered to you on time? Yeah, me too. Hi, my name is Mike Thomas, and this is Piyush Kalani, and we work on one of the many systems at Amazon responsible for ensuring that what you buy gets delivered. We're really excited to be here to give you a small peek under the hoods, and we're going to be sharing with you an architectural challenge that our particular team faced, and we'll be walking through how we overcame that challenge, you guessed it, with the help of AWS and DynamoDB. Thanks for taking the time out of the schedule to hear from us. All right, so just to, uh, I want to start off by setting the expectations for the session. So first, we're going uh, to be opening up the hood of our system, and we're going to be talking about the specific design challenges that our team faced from moving our team system off of Oracle and onto DynamoDB. We're going to walk through how we solve those challenges, and as we do so, we will highlight five techniques you may be able to apply to a system that you own. Shifting from a relational to a NoSQL database uh, is not always easy, and so we expect the techniques will be particularly useful if you find that your NoSQL database of choice doesn't quite provide everything you might want right out of the box. What this talk is not, this talk is not an introduction to Oracle. It's not an introduction to DynamoDB. We're going to assume quite a bit of background knowledge on the latter. It's not an exhaustive of all the designs we could have gone with, all the choices we could have make, made. We won't have uh, the time to do uh, all that nuanced justice. Uh, and again, it's uh, actually not going to be about how order processing at Amazon works. We're going to be looking at a little bit of a deeper uh, layer in the tech stack than that. So if this isn't what you're expecting, like, you can feel free to leave. No hard feelings. I won't take it personally. Piyush won't take it personally. And uh, don't worry, you'll still get your stuff delivered on time. All right, so let's get started. Here's the flow of the talk. First, I'm just going to introduce our system, its key functionality, our requirements, if you will. And then we're going to uh, dig in a little bit to our Oracle-based architecture, just to see kind of how it started to break down for us. Next, really the heart of the talk, we'll, uh, we'll cover the design challenges we faced when moving the system from Dynamo and how we overcame those. And finally, we'll summarize what results we saw once this re-architecture project was finally done. With that in mind, let me introduce our system. The system that Piyush and I work on is called Herd. Herd is a distributed workflow orchestration system used within Amazon, and you can think of us as a behind-the-scenes coordinator working across Amazon's service-oriented architecture. Engineering teams within Amazon use us to stitch together individual services step-by-step -step to form an end-to-end -end process that we call a workflow. So let's pretend for a minute that we're uh, the order processing team at Amazon, and we're going to build a really overly simplified version of how order processing at Amazon works. So at a high level, you might think that, hey, the first thing that might happen after you place an order on the website is that we should probably you know, charge the customer's credit card right, to make sure that uh, payment would be able to go through. And so we might plug in a payment service that knows how to do that. And if that charge is approved, you might then imagine plugging in a fulfillment service that knows how to uh, you know, determine which fulfillment center the customer's order should ship from and to ultimately ship the order. And on the contrary, if that order was declined, you can imagine plugging in an email service that knows how to email you and say, hey, your credit card is expired, can you please update it? Then, once you've got your workflow defined and you tell us to run an instance of one, we are responsible for driving all those steps through to completion. As we do so, we're going to record everything that happens and guarantee that it won't get lost. We can't have any orders left behind, right? Next, we're going to retry whenever there's a failure, because as you all know, in distributed systems, stuff breaks, right? Lastly, we're going to help you monitor and debug errors that might be happening in your workflow, both individually and in aggregate, because you won't be surprised to learn that Amazon has bugs, too. So in short, uh, we make sure your workflow gets to where it needs to go and that it stays safe along the way. 
hence the name herd. All right, so that's the mental model of what herd does. Throughout the rest of the talk, we're actually gonna zero in and focus on just one core piece of the system, the piece of the system responsible for storing each workflow instance as it runs. So let's take a look at the data model uh, that our storage system will need to work with. In herd, we call a single running instance of a workflow a work item. It has a string identifier, a string indicating the name of the workflow that's running, like order processing, a timestamp indicating when the workflow should run next, a string indicating the current step that the workflow is in, and a history list that records every event that occurs while the workflow is running. So now what we're gonna need is we're gonna, we're gonna need a system that lets us store these work items and query them in various ways. We'll call the system our work item storage service. And so now let's walk through the key pieces of functionality that the system is gonna need to be able to provide. So first thing we're gonna need is a history store. We're gonna be able to store a work item along with the history of events that occurred over time. So taking our example from before, the first thing that would happen is we'd move into that charge state. We'd, we'd be then calling that payment service to charge the customer's credit card. And say that charge was declined, We'd record that as an event on the history list there too. And next, we'll move on to that email service to email that the customer has, uh, that, that their payment has failed, and that gets recorded as an event as well. And that's really all there is to it for the history, serv uh, for the history store. Um, our storage system needs a way to store this history as the events accumulate over time. And once it's stored, we can't lose it, right? No order left behind. Next thing we need is actually a scheduled queue. When failures happen, workflows can get rescheduled for execution at a later time. So let's say we go to call that email service to notify the customer that their charge was declined, and let's say that that service is having a temporary outage. Stuff breaks, right? So we're gonna record that call failure as an event, maybe as an internal server error, and then depending on how the workflow's configured, we'll push out the next scheduled execution time. In this case, let's retry after three minutes, and you can see the time advances there. The job of our storage system will be to find the next work item scheduled to run for a given workflow type. And so, oh, and by the way, uh, workflows can be scheduled to run at basically any point in the future, like up from one second to now to years in the future, like think uh, uh, pre-orders for the next George R. R. Martin novel. <laughs> yeah, that's actually how that works. Um, <laughs> so the final piece of functionality we need is the ability to group, count, and list work items according to their current step. To see why, let's keep going with our example. We're in that email customer step, and the email service is having a temporary outage. We want to be able to monitor for failures that happen in real time to catch backlogs that might be building up in our workflows. That means we want to be able to not just work at a, look at a single work item, but across all work items in aggregate and see how many of them are running in each step. This is really handy for on-call engineers at Amazon. As you can imagine, having CloudWatch-style metrics getting published on this data and alarms firing and an on-call engineer getting paged whenever there's a problem. So when that email service goes down, instead of there just being a few workflows in the email customer step, it'll quickly balloon to maybe thousands or more, and an on-call engineer can be paged to look into the issue. That engineer is gonna be able to want to see what those thousands of work items are, maybe sample a few of them, look at the exceptions that were happening, see some stack traces, and use that information to solve the problem. And that's why we need the ability to list all the work items that are in a given step, too. All right, so actually, that's what all we need. We need a work item storage service that can do these three things. Not too bad, right? And indeed, we've actually had one of those on the herd team for a while. Here it is, this is our work item storage uh, system. It's a web service, and here's what it looked like back in 2009. Back in 2009, we had just three sharded Oracle databases. Each database was doing all three of those key pieces of functionality for us. You can imagine us having tables, storing the work item in the history, queries to find the next scheduled item to run, group by queries with some materialized views to aggregate and list workflows out per step, and we had indexes defined and, you know, to make everything efficient, some fairly standard stuff. The gray boxes here are all web services. You'll notice there's one per database. And this, is, uh, this exists because relational databases have limits on the number of connections that each can accept. 
So really those are just there to kind of pool all the Oracle connections together and the routing layer exists on top just to route request, requests appropriately and to aggregate the results. Simple enough, simple's good. But what created a problem for us was that our system was on average doubling in traffic volume year over year, thanks to increased adoption of herd by other teams within Amazon. And so the thing about doubling is it kind of sucks. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a good problem to have, but the thing is you build a system, right? And things work great at first, and then after a couple of years, you'll go from three databases to a dozen, and a couple of years after that, you'll have multiple dozens, almost 50, and soon you'll be in the hundreds. And so at this point in the story, the system's at a scale where we're running billions of workflows every single day. We have hundreds of millions of them running at any given point in time, and we're doing 100,000 steps every second. So where did the architecture start to break down? Well, firstly, the effort to scale the system is what really started to become untenable. So scaling this system up obviously meant provisioning new Oracle database hardware. But what that meant was things like creating Oracle database credentials, creating table schemas, tuning Oracle database settings, creating that new service to front them, getting the connection strings and plugging them into our application, provisioning a load balancer to sit in front of that web service, defining new alarms, doing functional testing and performance testing to make sure we didn't mess up any of that previous stuff. Oh, and then we had to have a whole way to actually repartition our data across the old shards and the new ones seamlessly without violating any system constraints for which we built a whole system that I'm not gonna have time to talk about. And then we had ongoing maintenance effort too. That wasn't where it ended, right? We had operating system patches we had to do, Oracle database software patches and upgrades that sometimes required 20 minutes of scheduled downtime. Scheduled downtime for processing orders at Amazon? Hmm. Uh, index rebuild jobs that would run that, to make sure the indexes were efficient. We'd have to fine tune their schedule to make sure that all of them didn't happen at the same time so that we'd, otherwise we'd have a big latency hit. We'd have to debug problems like why is one database slower than the others? Uh, you know, checking hardware metrics. Uh, maybe there's a bad query plan. Maybe the configuration's out of sync. Sometimes individual pieces of hardware would die due to a bad disk or an I.O. controller. I can honestly say I've been paged in the middle of the night for an I.O. controller dying. Um, and sometimes the automated failovers would fail and we'd have to have a database administrator get paged in to determine which database was uh, primary and which should actually be, you know, be the secondary. In short, you guys probably are familiar with this if you're running Oracle setups. These, uh, it required a lot of tender love and care for us. And I don't know about you, I only care about individual I.O. controllers so much. And so we decided, if, let's see if we can make this, all of this someone else's problem, DynamoDBs. All right, and now let's see uh, how we did that. So let's go back to the uh, three key pieces of functionality our system needs to provide. We need the history store, we need a scheduled queue, and group count and list. We're gonna start with the history store first. So recall with the Oracle-based architecture, each individual database did all three of those jobs for us. And so now let's like, take a look under the hoods of one of those and see how that history store actually operated. We actually had uh, simply two tables on Oracle, a work item table, which we'll call the header table going forward because it contains the work item's basic metadata like its ID and the workflow name, and a history table with a one-to-many relationship between the two. It's, actually, it's a fairly standard relational data database schema, actually probably a lot simpler than a lot of the systems that uh, you all own. Um, and on Oracle, we were you know, able to rely on Oracle's transactions to ensure that everything was consistent and, you know, uh, so, and that was good. But on DynamoDB, if we were to model the tables the same way, we'd run into a problem, right? As you know, DynamoDB does not natively support transactions across tables. And whenever we add a new history record, we typically also have to update something in the main header table, like the current step, and they have to stay in sync. And this is a problem because we can't guarantee that both updates will succeed. The history update might happen, but then the header might fail and we'd end up with this inconsistent state. We're in the charge step or are we in the ship step? I don't know. So our system really needs to provide a consistent view of the work item data to its users. And so this was the first big problem we encountered. Let's take a look at how we might solve it. So the first thing we realized, one thing we could do is just uh, store it all in one big table. DynamoDB provides reads your writes consistency for records within the same table. So why don't we just store the history in right there? 
no, no, no big deal, right? Well, for us, actually, the big deal was cost. So if you recall the DynamoDB costing model, you provision your throughput in advance, right? And uh, Dynamo charges per kilobyte you read and write. And what we just did by clubbing all that data into one record was make it so that we have to write a lot more data over time than ideally we should have to. Let me show you. So if, recall that the workflow history accrues as a work item executes. So say we have a series of updates happening to the work item, each two kilobytes in size. You can see that if we have three updates here in principle, we should really only have to write six kilobytes of data total. But instead, if we used our one single big table strategy, the first update would start out the same way. We'd write that two kilobytes. But what would we do for the second one? We'd read in the existing two, write and have our new two, uh, our additional two that's coming in with a new request, and we'd have to write back four. And if I repeat this, we'd read in uh, four, and then write back, add on two, and write back six. And so you can see what we actually got charged for 12 kilobytes of writes instead of six. And if we were to actually double our write costs in our actual production system, like this slide shows, for a system of our scale, that would be millions of more dollars per year that I'd be paying to AWS. Now, AWS is happy to have our business, but as the manager of the herd team, that would really wreak havoc on my budget, and I don't think our finance department would be too happy either. So we need to do better. So really, the challenge we set for ourselves was to minimize our rights. We wanted to keep the size of the, our frequently record, written records really small. Ideally, less than, a kilo, uh, less than or equal to a kilobyte, the minimum amount that Dynamo will charge you for on it right. What that means in practice is we wanted to move all of the extra data that didn't update very often out of that main table and only keep our keys and indexed attributes, which changed frequently. So along those lines, one thing we realized is that, hey, the work item history is immutable. Events only ever get added. So let's see if we can use that fact to our advantage. We'll try a variation of the two table idea. We'll have that one header record table for small indexed metadata and one history table in which to log events as they occur. Now, we don't have the transaction support across tables, right? And so we can't rely on DynamoDB's query API to let us see what history records exist. One might get written here before we have a chance to uh, update the associated header record. So instead of doing that, instead of relying on DynamoDB to give us the true list of what header records exist, let's maintain that list ourselves as a list of pointers within the header record. So here we write the header record, and as part of it, we write a little reference to the key of that history record that we just wrote. And now we know it exists. And as another history record gets, updated, uh, gets written over time, we add one here, and then we update the header record. And so when the caller comes in to read this, they always read that header record first. That tells the caller which history records exists, and then they're able to read the whole data set and get a consistent view of the work item. But let's throw a failure in and see what happens. So let's say I write a third history record, and then that update to the header record there fails. What happens? Well, so the, to the caller, they actually just see the same picture they saw before. They see that older version of the history record pointing to those two history records, and so they actually have a consistent view of the world still. But looking under the covers of the system, we do see this one odd thing here. We got an extra history record that nothing's pointing to. It's kind of orphaned. It's kind of cruft or garbage that's accumulated. And so that's a little wasteful, actually. Um, so then that is a problem. But let's get back to that in a second. Let's just keep going with the algorithm forward. If I, write a nut, if I retry that right and add that third record back again, and I then update the header record and it succeeds this time, Yes, it all still works. The um, caller can get a consistent view with these three latest records. And you'll notice we wrote, except for that cruft, we wrote six kilobytes of data total, not 12. So we actually achieved our cost-saving goal as long as those failures aren't happening that often. And so this introduces the first technique we use that maybe you could use in a system you own. Um, we, we separated out these large immutable payloads from small, mutable data in order to reduce our costs. All right, so we've got that Croft problem, though. 
do we have any others? We can read all these records in parallel, right? So latency is a concern for our system, but since we have that parallelism, it isn't a problem. But what we do have is a scalability problem. Here's why. So some of our work items get updated a lot more often than others, say hundreds or thousands of times more often. And now loading thousands of history records in parallel wouldn't really scale or perform that well. The odds of one in a thousand calls failing is pretty high, even for a really four nines highly available service. And so we gotta solve that somehow. So to solve that, let's try the following. Let's limit the number, the, the maximum amount of parallel calls we'll ever make. To do that, we'll set a limit on the number of references we'll hold. A limit on the maximum number of history records. In this case, let's try four. So now, when that new fifth record comes in, what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna take it and we're gonna bundle it together with all the four existing, existing records. We're gonna load those four and we're gonna write one big blob of data that's 10 kilobytes. So now that's an expensive write and you might notice and we are paying extra in that case. So in our real system, we are gonna tune that limit so that's, that this somewhat inefficient compaction uh, operation only happens really rarely. But, and remember the key thing here is that we did actually just limit the amount of parallelism and so we did get the scalability we needed with this little bit of extra cost. So th that actually helps us pretty well, except for one other problem. <laughs> what if this problem, uh, what if this algorithm keeps repeating and this record size grows bigger and bigger and bigger? DynamoDB has limits on the maximum item sizes it can hold, right? What if this becomes 10 megabytes? So what we do there instead, we actually just did something pretty simple. Um, if it's bigger than DynamoDB's limit, we just put it in S3. S3 is another uh, key value storage, uh, storage service that AWS provides that you're probably familiar with. It's really good for storing large binary payloads. So we just did that and we kept a little pointer bit inside of the header record that said, hey, this one is in S3 so that when we go, to, when we go to load it, we know where to look. Okay, we still got this cruft though that I've been conveniently ignoring. Isn't that bad? Yes, and I'm actually, but I'm actually gonna cheat a little bit here. So uh, when workflows finish in our system, they're archived out. And at that time, we have a chance to list or to query from DynamoDB and find all the stuff that was there that might have gotten orphaned that doesn't have a strongly uh, referenced pointer associated with it. And so we do have a way to make sure that most of that cruft gets deleted in the end. And so this introduces the second key technique that we used. We were able to work around not having transactions by being a little bit efficient, rarely, leaving that cruft behind, but only for a small percentage of calls. And as long as we had a way to monitor it and make sure we did clean it up afterwards, um, and I found this technique a little bit surprising at first, right? Because as engineers in our systems, oftentimes we want things to be like perfect and for some definition of perfect, right? But this was actually turned out to be a really practical, uh, good trade-off for us to make. And so uh, this is what our architecture looks like now. We've just got this uh, work item storage service so far, pointing to DynamoDB. We've got a couple of tables in there. And that covers how we did the history store. And so now I'll turn it over to Piyush, who will get to talk about the hard stuff. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Once again, my name is Piyush Kalani. I am a software development engineer at Amazon. And I have got lots of things to cover today. So let's get back to our slides. So we just saw how we used DynamoDB and S3 to store our work item history. Now let's take a look at how we built a scheduled queue on top of DynamoDB. So let's get familiar with the requirements and what made this problem really challenging for us. So we process billions of work items every day and at, at any given point of time, we have hundreds of millions of them active. And we have a very large fleet of hosts, we call it engine, which is constantly polling our work item storage service, asking it a very simple question. Find me the next work item to process for a given workflow. And we have tens of thousands of threads who are dedicated for a given workflow who are all asking this question in parallel. At the time of our launch, our biggest workflow had about 60 million active items. And so the challenging thing was 
to be able to find that one item which is ready to get processed. And we had to find that item within like a couple of seconds of its scheduled time. And that's because we have some latency sensitive use cases which execute on our platform. For example, when you place a Prime Now order on Amazon.com, we only have minutes from the time you place the order to the time it has to be shipped out from our warehouse. And multiple systems work together to make that happen. And so we want to make sure that all these systems, the delay introduced by these systems is as small as possible so that all of you can get your stuff on time. And finally, we execute tens of thousands of work items every second. So it's not just about finding that one item. It's about finding tens of thousands of those every second in parallel without stepping over each other. All right, so before we look into the solution, Let's recap some of the key DynamoDB concepts which I'm going to use in this talk and get familiar with the imagery which I'm going to use to represent them. So here are DynamoDB partitions. These are the physical host where they store the data which we provide. They also call it a storage node. Each storage node has replicas and different availability zones for redundancy. For today's talk, I'm not going to show the replicas for simplicity. This is the DynamoDB load balancer using which clients read and write data. Let's quickly run through some examples here. So let's say if you need to write a record with partition key A and sort key 2, Dynamo is going to hash our partition key and it's going to map it to one of its storage node in the backend. And since they only hash the partition key, every record which has the same partition key will always get mapped to the same storage node in the backend. And they'll all be stored in the order of its sort key. So in today's talk, I'm going to represent a particular partition keys space on a given storage node using this blue vertical bar. And every record in this blue vertical bar will have the same partition key, and they'll all be ordered by its sort key. So for example, for example, if we write another record with partition key A and sort key 1, it's going to go right above it. Another one, if you write with sort key 3, it's going to go below it. Let's write another one with partition key B this time. That may happen to get mapped to a different storage node as we have changed our partition key. And let's say another one with partition key C. Well, it can get mapped to a storage node which already has records from a different partition key. All right, so with that understanding, let's start building our solution. So, so far we have introduced this work item header table. The partition key on this table is the identifier of the work item. Now for scheduled queue functionality, the query which we need to support is to find the next item which is ready to get processed. And an item is ready to get processed when its scheduled time is less than or equal to current time. And so if you need to make that query on this main header table, it's going to be extremely inefficient as there are no indexes on the attribute workflow name or on the attribute scheduled time. And so to be able to make this query efficient, we are going to leverage DynamoDB's global secondary indexing support also commonly known as GSI. So we'll create a new GSI, we'll name it timer. We'll set our partition key on the attribute workflow name and set the sort key on the attribute scheduled time. Now we can use this index and efficiently query and find the next work item for a given workflow which has the earliest scheduled time. And then we can easily check if it is ready to get processed or not. So does that solve our problem here? Well, not really. If you have one single partition key for a given workflow, all work items which we are going to process for this particular workflow, they're all going to get funneled into this one single storage node. And eventually, this storage node is going to end up throttling. That's because a single storage node can only support a certain amount of throughput. So what can we do to make it scale? Well, the real problem is that we have one single partition key for a given workflow. So what if we shard this into n different partition keys? And one way to do that is simply by adding a suffix. Now for every work item which we process for this particular workflow, we can map it to one of the n partition key in the back end behind the scenes. So basically all work items which are getting processed for this particular workflow can now be evenly distributed across these n partition keys. Will that make our solution scalable? Well, it really depends on the value of n in comparison to number of storage nodes which you have in DynamoDB. 
Let's quickly run through some examples here to understand that. Let's say we have five partition keys for a given workflow, and we have five storage nodes in the back end. Well, when DynamoDB is going to map these partition keys to their storage nodes, there's a very good chance that one of the storage node may end up with two or even more partition keys mapped to it. Well, so in an ideal case, we wanted that each storage node should only receive 20% of the traffic for this particular workflow, as there are only five storage nodes. But in this case, this particular storage node will receive 40% of the traffic, which is quite a lot higher, and it may end up throttling, even though we have another storage node which is not receiving any traffic at all for this workflow. So what if we have hundreds of partition keys and still five storage nodes? Well, in that case, the distribution will still not be 100% even, but it will be a lot more uniform than before. The storage node, which ends up receiving maximum number of partition keys, may end up getting somewhere from 20 to 25% of the traffic, which is still a lot closer to 20%, which we want to achieve. So as we increase the number of partition keys, our distribution is going to become better and better. And better distribution means better scalability because now we can use the entire capacity which is allocated to us. And so that's our technique number three. Avoid hot DynamoDB partitions by manufacturing additional keys and get better scalability. All right, so more keys means better distribution. So does that mean we can have 100,000 keys for a given workflow or even more? Well, if you have 100,000 keys for a workflow, we need to query each one of them independently to be able to find that next item which is ready to get processed. And that's a lot of work to do. And it's going to be impossible to do all of that within the couple of seconds of SLA we need to maintain. So yes, as we increase the number of partition keys, our distribution becomes better and better. But discovering that next item is going to become harder and harder. And so clearly, we needed to strike a balance here. So we decided to keep the number of partition keys for individual workflows to be in thousands, because given the number of storage nodes we needed at the time of our launch, having thousands of partition keys would have ensured that our load is roughly evenly distributed across each of those storage nodes. And we kept this value configurable in our system so that when we scale up in future and add more storage nodes, our distribution will still be roughly evenly distributed if we can in proportionately increase those partition keys. All right, so with thousands of partition keys, how do we still find that next item which is ready to get processed? Well, we'll have to query each one of them independently. And that's still a lot of work to do. Moreover, we need to be able to read thousands of items in order to find that one item. And we need to do that over and over again on every poll request. And that's going to be extremely inefficient and costly. So there's a very common technique used in computer science to be able to deal with problems like this. It's called cache prefetching. What it means is, if we know that we are going to need some data in future, proactively prefetch that data from a memory which is slower to access and put it in a memory which is faster to access. Well, in our case, our data is in DynamoDB. So what is faster to access than DynamoDB? RAM. So what if we proactively prefetch the topmost items from each of these thousands of partition keys and put it in the memory of a host? Let's give that a try. So this is the same image as before, just a bit zoomed in. At the bottommost layer, we have DynamoDB storage nodes. Each storage node has data for the view GSI. Each storage node has multiple partition keys mapped to it. Each partition key has multiple work items mapped to it. And they are all so ordered by its scheduled time. So basically, the item right at the top has the earliest scheduled time for that, that particular partition key. Now let's put an host in front of it. And we'll make this host proactively prefetch the topmost items from each of the partition, thousand partition keys. And it's going to put it in its in-memory indexed cache data structure, which has support for finding the next item which has the earliest scheduled time. 
Now, all we need to do whenever we receive a pull request is to route that request to this host, and it can answer the it can find the next item within a few milliseconds. Well, that's great, except one host will not be able to scale for the pole throughput, which we need to support for our largest workflow. So what do we do when one host doesn't scale? We add more hosts. Now we'll be able to route our pole throughput to any one of these hosts, and so we'll be able to scale for that. But we still have two main problems. One, each host needs to query for all the thousands of partition keys. And that's a lot of work to do, especially in a couple of seconds. And so this solution doesn't really scale as, as, as when we increase the number of partition keys in future, this won't be able to scale for that. Second, records from each of these partition keys are loaded into the memory of every host. So basically, every host is going to return the same set of items on a pull request which will lead to contention, and it will kill our system's throughput. So we came up with a solution which solved both of these problems. What we did was we grouped certain partition keys together, and leader elected a single host which has exclusive access to those partition keys. So basically, in this example, partition keys order processing 1, 2, and 3, we grouped them together leader elected host one to have exclusive access to them. And so basically, no other host except host one can own those. Similarly, we grouped another set of partition keys and leader elected host two for that and continued that process until all partition keys were uniquely assigned to an individual host. Now, this solves both of our previous problems. Each host only has to own a fixed set of partition keys, and it only needs to query for those set. So it makes it scalable now. Because as we add more partition keys, we can simply add more hosts and make them own the new partition keys. Second, records from each of these partition keys are now loaded into the memory of a single host. And so each host is going to return a unique set of records on every poll request, thus avoiding any sort of contention whatsoever. All right, there's one more last thing we need to take care of. As these hosts hand out records, as part of poll response, we want to update the main work item header table and set the scheduled time of these work items to current time plus x minutes. And there are two reasons why we want to do that. One, when we hand out records as part of poll re response, we want these items to move below in the index so that when we query next time, we see new set of items thus avoiding any sort of starvation. Second, let's say in case of a failure, let's say the engine host we, which picked up this particular record crashed, we don't want to forget about this item. Remember, we don't want to leave behind any orders. We want this item to surface up back again in some time so that we can retry processing it by handing it over to a different engine host. And that is the reason why we don't delete an item from the index. We simply push them down. Now, in a happy case, before our x minutes expire, our engine host will be able to successfully process an item, and it will update. It will provide a new schedule time using which we'll update it in the GSI. All right, let's put it all together. At the bottommost layer, we have the DynamoDB storage nodes. Each storage node has multiple application partition keys mapped to them. At the application layer, we have this bunch of EC2 hosts. And given that EC2 hosts are really powerful these days, at the time of our launch, we needed about 10 hosts to support the throughput of our largest workflow. Above it, we added a timer router, which had a bunch of stateless EC2 hosts behind a load balancer. And whenever it receives a pull request for a given workflow, it simply routes that request to one of the hosts randomly, which owns a partition key for that particular workflow. And given that we had tens of thousands of threads who are constantly polling for a given workflow, and only like 10 hosts which has worked for a given workflow, the simple strategy of randomly routing the request worked really great. We were able to hit every host pretty frequently looking for work. And if you can see, now our solution is scalable at every, like horizontally scalable at every layer. 
At the bottommost layer, we have DynamoDB storage nodes, and they can scale by simply adding more storage nodes. Then we can proportionately increase the number of partition keys. Then we can proportionately also increase the number of application hosts. And finally, we can also proportionately increase the number of polling threads so as to maintain the same SLA for finding the work. So that's our solution for the scheduled queue functionality. But if you have noticed, as part of this coming up with the solution, we have introduced this concept of leader election. And leader election is not easy to do. Although it's a well-known computer science problem, and so I'm not going to explain how we solve this problem for us because of the time constraint. In short, we created an application called Partition Assigner, which did leader election for us using a couple of tables on DynamoDB. If you would like to learn more about this, please feel free to reach out to me after this presentation. All right, so putting it all together is technique number four today. Move hard problems into memory where everything is easy. Well, kind of. We still have to do leader election, and that's not easy. But consolidating tens of millions of records into the memory of handful of hosts allowed us to do some kind of complicated query across these tens of millions of items. Well, in this case specifically, it allowed us to find that next item, which is ready to get processed within a few milliseconds. And so that sums up our technique number four. All right, moving on. There's one problem I've conveniently ignored so far, GSI propagation delay. So how does it really affect our de current design? Let's take a look. So this is our architecture so far. Let me walk you through this quickly before I explain the issue. This is the work item storage service. We have seen that before. It writes to the main DynamoDB work item header table. These are the main tables on DynamoDB work item header table, and when we write to that, it rep DynamoDB replicates our write to dy timer GSI. On the bottom left, we have timer hosts, which participate in leader election. They know, each of these hosts know what partition keys they own using our leader election system. And once they know that, they periodically query the timer GSI and read the topmost records from each of those partition keys and load it in its mem in memory cache. And then finally, this is the timer router Again, host here know which timer host owns what partition keys using our leader election system. And once it knows that, it uses that information to appropriately route requests among these set of timer hosts. So let's take a look at our GSI propagation delay issue. So when a new insert work item request comes in for a work item which is ready to get processed immediately, the first thing we do is we write that record to DynamoDB's main work item header table. Let's say that happened at time t1. At some point later, DynamoDB is going to replicate this to timer GSI. Let's say that happened at time t2. And finally, at some point later, one of the timer hosts will query this record and put it in its in-memory cache. Let's say that happened at time t3. Now, what we really want is that the time between t1 and t3 to be under a couple of seconds, because that's when the item is available for processing. And in a happy case, that's achievable because DynamoDB's replication to the GSI happens within sub-seconds. And we can make our timer host query like really aggressively, like once every second for every partition key. But DynamoDB's documentation also cautions us, saying that this delay can be longer in case of an unlikely failure scenario. And so as I mentioned before, if the delay is going to be more than a few seconds, it can negatively affect the latency-sensitive workflows which execute on our platform. And so that wasn't acceptable to us. So here's what we did to solve this problem. Like before, when a new insert work item request comes in, we first write it in, into DynamoDB. Now, once this record has been written successfully, there's one thing we know for sure, that at some point in future, this record is going to get propagated to one of the timer hosts. So instead of waiting for all of that to happen, we make it happen instantly by simply forwarding that request to timer router, which then forwards it to the appropriate timer host. And that host takes this record and primes its in-memory cache instantly. So within a few milliseconds now, we have this record available for processing. Yes, it involves two network hops. 
and that can fail transiently sometimes due to like transient network failures. But with enough retries, we get about 99.999% success rate for this call, and that's good enough for our use cases. And the background replication and querying is still happening. Hold on. Background querying is still happening, and that helps us catch any record which actually failed to get propagated due to transient network failures. It also helps a new host which just got leader elected to be able to prime its cache by reading all the record from DynamoDB. So this background querying is our mechanism to guarantee that every record which we wrote to DynamoDB successfully will be eventually available for processing. And this best effort priming of cache technique ensures that 99.999% of those records are actually available instantly for processing. And so that's our technique number five today. And this seems like it's not working. All right. Prime caches to minimize eventual consistency delays for the GSIs. Here is the architecture so far. We have the new components as timer router, timer host, and the timer GSI. And right at the bottom, we have partition assigner, which does leader election for us. And that's how we built a scalable, distributed, scheduled queue on top of DynamoDB. All right, a lot of technical content, and there's still one more functionality to cover. To be honest, if I was sitting right there, I'll be exhausted by now. So I promise no more new techniques. I'm going to show how we solve this last key piece of functionality by reusing the techniques which we have already shown. So ability to group, count, and list. Let's recap the requirements for this. So for every work item which execute on our platform, we show a view like this. Basically, it shows the total number of work items which are executing for that particular workflow broken down by the step in which it is in. And this is really useful for our clients for debugging and monitoring their workflows. And so again, the challenging thing here was to be able to generate this view we had to aggregate across hundreds of millions of items. And so this problem started to sound very similar to a timer problem. We need to loop through millions of millions of items and do some kind of complicated query across all of them. So we thought, OK, let's try to apply the same set of solution and techniques which we applied to our timer problem and see if we can solve this problem as well. So like before, we first created a GSI called it view, and we set our partition key on the attribute workflow name. Then the first technique which we applied to our timer solution was to avoid hot DynamoDB partitions by manufacturing additional keys. So we went back and added a suffix to our partition key, and now we are, we'll be able to generate multiple partition keys for our workflows, and that'll make our solution scalable on DynamoDB. Then the next technique which we applied to a timer solution was to move hard problems into memory. And so this is the same image as before. We have the storage nodes, which has this time, this storage nodes have data for the view GSI. And similarly, like before, we have application host. Each one of them owns exclusive set of partition keys. And each host, in this case, queries for all the records which exist in the partition keys which that host owns. And once it's do that, all of these hosts put those data in its in-memory indexed data structure, and that data structure has support for group, count, and list. And now, similar to our timer solution, we add a router in front, and whenever it receives a request for aggregating across for a given workflow, it calls out to every host in parallel, gets the locally aggregated results, does a global aggregation locally, and then returns the response. And that's how we supported ability to group and count. And list works pretty much the same way, except that the call is paginated because, of course, we can't return hundreds of millions of items as part of a single API call. OK, so now since this host has to read all the records from each of the partition keys it owns, it takes us about a couple of minutes to be able to generate the view we need. And that's fine for our use cases for two reasons. One, the use case for this is for debugging and monitoring. 
and so a delay of two minutes isn't the end of the world. And second, the, the main reason is that we use the same technique here, which we use for a timer solution, which was to prime caches to minimize eventual consistency delays. And so basically, that delay of two minutes occurred only initially when a new host got leader elected, and it had to read all the data from DynamoDB. Once it did that, the host was receiving almost all updates, live updates, which we were making on DynamoDB instantly, well, except for the ones which failed due to transient network failures. And so the host was able to provide almost 99.99% accurate results henceforth. And yes, the background querying was again still going on to be able to catch any records which were missed due to network failures. All right, so as the pro solution to this problem was exactly similar to our timer problem, the view architecture is a mirror image of our timer architecture. We have the view routers, the view host, and a view GSI. And the partition assigner did leader election for this new set of view hosts as well. And this is the final architecture which we ended up on, on a DynamoDB-based system. And that's how we built the key, three key pieces of functionality on top of DynamoDB. Let's quickly recap the five key techniques we have shown you guys today. Separate large payloads from small mutable data. And as Mike showed us before, that helped us reduce our cost. Be a little inefficient, rarely. And as long as we can monitor and ensure it's only rarely, it works out fine. In our case, it helped us optimize for scale. Avoid hot DynamoDB partitions by manufacturing additional keys, and that helped us scale on top of DynamoDB. Move hard problems into memory, where doing any kind of complicated query is easy, right? And finally, prime caches to minimize eventual consistency delays. And particularly, the last two techniques, four and five, combined together was really powerful. It allowed us to do some kind of complicated query across hundreds of millions of items and still get pretty accurate results of those queries within like few milliseconds. All right, that's it from me. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me patiently. I would hand over Mike now, back to Mike, to, to share the results with us. <clears throat> Thanks, Piyush. All right, so let's, uh, let's close with a brief comparison of the two architectures that we had. Oracle, our Oracle-based architecture, it was actually awesome for us in some ways. Each integral database was able to perform all that complicated stuff for us right within the database. Heck, we built a scheduled queue on top of Oracle and it worked. <laughs> I dare say at a smaller scale, it actually worked well. But the Oracle databases didn't scale themselves. They didn't patch themselves. They re required manual uh, effort and tender love and care on our end. Remember this slide from before? Compare that with the new architecture. Mike, well, I just want to use the laptop. Yeah. Um, oops. Cool. Compare that with the uh, new DynamoDB-based architecture. In this setup, Timer and view, services, view service are isolated systems. These pieces of functionality can now scale and fail independently, which is a really nice property to have in a system. You might notice, though, uh, we still have partitions. And we even have some individual hosts that we do care about, right? But the key difference now is that none of those hosts are special. None has any special configuration. None has any durable data on its disk. If any dies, we automatically replace them with another EC2 host within seconds. And to scale up our durable store, we just ask DynamoDB to scale that up, and it does. So what did we see for results? So one great thing we saw was that our workflow processing delays actually dropped 10x with this new architecture at the 50th percentile from one second down to 100 milliseconds. And that's in large part thanks to those two techniques that Piyush had there of querying data in memory and priming the caches. Secondly, our latency and availability improved. Uh, especially, we didn't have to worry about database failovers and those index rebuild jobs anymore. We can scale down now. Uh, we don't have that durable state anymore. And this is, with the Oracle databases, this is something we wouldn't have ever even thought about 
doing, honestly, and this saves us money, which is great. And we've got that architectural isolation. We can scale uh, and uh, uh, those systems can fail independently. Now, as awesome as all those results are, they were actually really just bonus results. <laughs> we would have done this project even if we didn't get any of these benefits. Our main victory was that the ongoing effort to scale and maintain the system also dropped by 10x. In, in like 2015 or 16, at the end of the life of this uh, Oracle-based system, we were spending 60 developer weeks every year scaling the system up, and that dropped down to six. We did the math, and we actually would have needed over 1,000 Oracle hosts to go through last Prime Day this July, and soon, like, my team would have been doing nothing but just scaling the system up. And instead, we can actually innovate on behalf of our internal customers now. And so this is uh, really what I would encourage you all to take a hard look at with your systems that you own. How much time are you spending just kind of keeping the lights on? For us, even though we did have to build on top of DynamoDB, it did still end up with a net reduction in our maintenance efforts. That was, it was, it was so worth it. <laughs> oh, and by the way, uh, in case you can't tell, going through all the algorithms and designing all this was kind of a lot of fun for us too. <laughs> and so that's why and how we replaced hundreds of databases with one big one. Thank you. For questions, feel free to come on up. We'll take them kind of offline. Thank you, everyone.